Who is the subject of epistemology? Right? When we tell people what knowledge is or what justification is, well, whose knowledge are we talking about and whose justification are we talking about? Well, if we pick up any contemporary epistemology article, chances are that we will find that this subject is called S, right? Is it, it is S who has knowledge. It is S knows that P, if and only if P is true and S believes P and S is justified in believing that P and so on. And of course here the letter S is just the first letter of subject. So the way that epistemology usually talks about its subjects, about the people who have knowledge, is at a very abstract level, right? It's S, and S has no age, no face, no name, no gender, no historical position. S is just S, right? And so one could say that S is nobody, or one could say that S is everybody, that it's supposed to be a blank slot into which any particular person can be put in order to apply the analysis to them. And now one question we may ask is whether we should be worried that epistemology is so focused on a very abstract subject rather than talking about specific people with their specific properties and their specific backgrounds and their specific social position and so on. In this video, I want to argue first that there's a very good reason for epistemology to focus on this abstract S, but then I also want to discuss a few worries that this might generate. A few reasons to think that well, maybe it's fine to talk about S, but we should also be aware that there are many interesting things to say about the subject of knowledge that have to do with their very concrete circumstances and their very concrete backgrounds, experiences, and so on. So the uh, way that this video is set up is first I'm going to give you a little general story about why we should expect the abstract subject S to make its appearance so centrally in epistemology. And then I'm gonna talk about several kinds of worries that you might have, which I think are mostly invitations to make sure that we pay enough attention to perhaps at first sight, two concrete elements of you know, human beings, uh, but elements that turn out to be very relevant to understanding knowledge and other epistemic subjects. So first, why is epistemology usually talking about this abstract subject S? Well, as soon as we start thinking about any normative notion, we are invited or maybe even forced to take a kind of universalizing move, to move away from the specific person and try to formulate a rule that is general. So let's think for instance about logic. Suppose that I ask you, well, suppose that I believe P, and I believe that P implies Q, should I conclude that Q? And what you answer is, well, Victor, you should. And the emphasis on you, right? Which suggests that I should, but maybe other people shouldn't. Well, that doesn't seem to be a very good answer, right? It's an answer that's going to raise my eyebrows because I'm thinking like, what, I should? But why not other people, right? If this is a valid way of argumentation, then I should but then everybody should. And if it's not a valid way of argumentation, then nobody should, including me. So when we try to formulate uh, a sort of logical rule or norm, it seems that we automatically want or need it to be understood as a general rule or norm. It can't be the case that my logic is different from your logic. We want to know what is the right way of reasoning. And this phenomenon um, can be really seen whenever we approach a normative subject in, in philosophy. So for instance, think about ethics, right? If I say, you know, it's wrong to kill people and you say, ah, well, it's wrong for you to kill people. Like, wait a second. I mean, if it's really morally wrong, right? If it's really ethically the case that we shouldn't kill people, then we shouldn't kill people and I shouldn't do it and you shouldn't do it either. Right? And there might be circumstances where it is wrong for me to kill people and not wrong for you. I mean, maybe you are being assaulted by a bunch of murderers and now you have to defend yourself and I'm not, I'm just in a park with some peace loving people. Um, but then it would seem to be the case that, you know, we have to still 
formulate our ethical rules as a sort of universal claims, right? Because it's not so much that it's wrong for me to kill people and right for you to kill people. It's wrong to kill people if they are just peace-loving people in a park. It might be okay to kill people if they are vicious murderers trying to kill you. That's, that's the universal rule. If I had been attacked by vicious murderers, I would be allowed to do the same things ethically that you are allowed to do. If you had been in a park, you would have been bound by the same ethical rules that bind me. Right? So that's a way that we tend to think about normativity. And it's fairly hard to see how we could do something like ethics or logic if we didn't think that its rules are in some sense universalizable. They're not for me. They're not for you. They're for us. Right? They're for everyone. They're supposed to be general. And that's true for epistemology too. Right? I mean, if I say, well, you know, that's okay for you to believe, but I shouldn't believe that, that's weird, right? If I think it's okay for you to believe it, then I'm, I mean, surely that can only mean that there are good reasons to believe it, right? Otherwise, I should say, no, no, you oughtn't believe that. Here are the reasons to not believe it. And if there are good reasons to believe it, then I should believe it too. Right? I mean, it's very, very hard to see how we could make statements about what it is to have knowledge or uh, what we ought to believe and so on, how to make them specific to people rather than make them universal and generalized. And so there's a very good reason to believe that in epistemology, like the primary subject that we ought to be interested in is S. It's this empty place that anybody can be put into. It is a universal subject. And of course, as we have already seen with my slightly gruesome example of being attacked by murderers versus being in a peaceful park, uh, those rules should be context sensitive, right? I mean, the rules that tell you what you're allowed to do should be sensitive to context. The rules that tell you what you ought to believe should be sensitive to context. In particular, for instance, um, the rules that tell us, for instance, what it is to be justified should be such that it turns out that I am not justified in believing that the sun revolves around the earth, but that a 12th century scientist is justified in believing that the sun revolves around the earth, right? Our different evidence, our different background knowledge, our different place in history should be slotted into our definition of justification to give the right answer here. And that's the way one could say that the specific subject makes its appearance in epistemology. Right, S knows that P, if and only if, and then there's a list, right? And one of them is S is justified in believing that P. Well, I am justified in believing that the earth moves around the sun rather than the other way around. And maybe the 11th century scientist would not be justified in believing that. So even if they had believed that the earth moves around the sun, they still wouldn't have known it. That's possible. That's where context can come in. So. All of which is me saying that it's completely fine that in epistemology we focus on the subject S and it's not just fine, it's inevitable. That's what happens in any normative subject in philosophy. It is possible to have some doubts about this entire philosophical strategy. There's a pretty great passage by Nietzsche called um, Long Live Physics, probably in English. It's, uh, it's in The Gay Science. Um, in which Nietzsche tells us that formulating universal ethical rules, that there's something wrong with that. In fact, it shows a kind of lack of self-knowledge because what it shows is that you don't understand that every situation is unique. And so whatever situation you find yourself in, it can never be the case that you just have to apply a rule to it to find out what to do. And there is something to that criticism. And I think one lesson that we could take away from Nietzsche is that we shouldn't be doing these normative disciplines, maybe. I think a more interesting thing to take away from Nietzsche is to take away the idea that, you know, whatever rule we're going to formulate, we always might have to reevaluate it in the light of new circumstances, right? I mean, we can never claim that our rules are going to be adequate to all these circumstances, many of which we haven't even imagined that we might find ourselves in. So that's a caveat that I want to make here. And I think we can engage in like S-centered epistemology or subjects that like this, this universal subject-centered ethics and so on, try to formulate general rules. 
while keeping Nietzsche's caveat in mind that this is a way of of you know trying to work things out rather than a way of finding the one final true answer okay so that said I now want to look at some more particular worries that people might have um, stemming from the fact that epistemology is focusing on this abstract subject S and all of these worries I think are going to be of the following kind they're going to say that if we focus too much on this abstract S there is a danger of us overlooking or not paying attention to uh, an epistemologically interesting dimension of you know our our social situation of who we are of our knowledge and so on so let me say that again what I think that the worries I'm going to talk about what they share is not so much that they say oh traditional epistemology is wrong right we should never write down s knows that p what they all share is the worry that if we focus too much on that we might be staying at a too abstract level and not have in pay enough attention to very concrete facts about people's lives which are also epistemically interesting so let's make that concrete here's the first worry the first worry is that there are what we might want to call non-epistemic factors so things we usually don't talk about in epistemology non-epistemic factors that actually influence the standards of knowledge like the norms that we investigate in epistemology so there are factors about people's concrete lives that don't seem to be very epistemological factors but that are epistemologically interesting because they change the epistemic norms let's give an example of that well an example of that is discussed in the literature under the uh, name of pragmatic encroachment and the idea would be that epistemic standards actually depend not just on what we usually think of as epistemic elements but also on something that's very practical and pragmatic on stakes on what is at stake so for instance suppose that you ask me hey Victor is it really true that piranhas will just eat living human beings when they find them in the water and I tell you no no that's a myth they'll probably just swim away from you right piranhas do not eat living human beings when they find them in the water and you say oh do you know that and I say yes I know that I know that I've read it I've looked it up I've remembered it I know this piranhas don't eat living people in the river okay I think it's fair it's fair to say that I know this now consider another situation in this situation I am in South America I am very near to a river full of piranhas in fact I am hanging by a tree branch holding on for dear life just above a raging river in the jungle and it is completely filled with piranhas I can see hundreds of them from where I'm hanging and somebody says uh, well why don't you just let go don't you know that piranhas don't eat people and I'm like no I mean I've heard about it but I I don't know it right I don't know it I'm not gonna let go and that also seems fair I mean there's so much at stake here like my life is at stake here um, that it seems fair to say that I don't know that piranhas don't eat people when they fall into the water it seems that like the higher stakes have raised the standards of knowledge and you might agree with that or disagree with that but it's a, it's not a crazy thought right that if the practical stakes are higher that then the the bar for knowledge is going to be higher as well and if that's true then we have an epistemological description of knowledge an epistemic norm which depends on stakes like practical stakes which doesn't seem to be a very epistemological term at least at first sight so what we're seeing here is that we should maybe sometimes make s a little bit more concrete like we should also think about s's stakes uh, about S's practical situation if we want to do epistemology so here's a second I'm going to briefly discuss it uh, a second example of the same kind maybe epistemic norms the norm of knowledge uh, can also have something 
to do can also depend on somebody's duties or social role, right? So suppose that there are people sitting in a plane, right? And we wonder, well, do those people know that the plane has enough fuel to actually make the trip? And I think it's fair to say that they know, right? I mean, they have a justified true belief. It doesn't seem to be some kind of weird get here situation. I mean, if people didn't know that, they would be crazy to get on planes, right? So I think it's fair to say that they know it. But now suppose that one of those people is the, the pilot, right? The captain of the plane. And one of the things that the captain of the plane has to do is check that there's enough fuel, right? I mean, it's got to do check a lot of things before takeoff. And one of the things that they got to check is, is there enough fuel? And this captain thinks, oh, I already know that there's enough fuel. I'm not going to check it. So they don't check it. Like they have to do it. It's part of the, the usual procedure. They don't do it. They don't check the fuel uh, and they just take off. Does that captain know that the plane has enough fuel? I mean, they've got the same evidence that the people in the plane have, right? And still it makes some sense to say that they don't know, right? That the captain doesn't know because the captain has a higher duty, um, or we should say a duty to take more epistemic care. And they didn't fulfill the duty. And if they didn't fulfill the duty, then we shouldn't say that they know that there's enough fuel on the plane. So I think that makes sense. I think it makes sense to, to believe that fairly social and concrete things like somebody's pragmatic situation or somebody's social role can have an influence on how we should evaluate their living up to epistemic norms. Again, this doesn't prove that traditional epistemology is wrong. It shows us that there are some things that maybe in traditional epistemology we didn't think about very much because we thought that they were too concrete, but that we ought to think about. Okay, so here's a second worry, and it's closely related to the first worry. It's also the worry that certain non-epistemic factors um, are going to be ignored or not paid enough attention to. But these, this time, not non-epistemic factors that change the standards of knowledge, but non-epistemic factors that have to do with the availability of knowledge. And so here's one thing we might, uh, we might find interesting. We might find it interesting that somebody's embedding in a technological situation, and so this has to do, of course, with their position in history, uh, as well as with their position maybe in society and, and things like that, but certainly with their position in history, that somebody's embedding in a historical situation namely a technological situation, might have big implications for their, um, for their knowledge, for the kinds of knowledge that they can have and for the, um, the way that they can have knowledge. So here's an example. Suppose that you ask me whether I know what grades Mary got for her last exam of my course. Like you call me, you're a fellow teacher of me. You say, hey, Mary, do you know what grade Mary got for your epistemology midterm exam? And I say, yes, let me look it up. Did I just contradict myself, right? Did I contradict myself when I said, yes, I know what grade Mary got, let me look it up. And there's one way in which you might want to say, oh, well, yeah, that's a contradiction. I mean, if you know it, you don't have to look it up. But I don't think there's anything unnatural about what I said, right? I mean, we talk about, we talk like this all the time. Um, apparently, it makes sense to say that I know what grade Mary got if I have it ready, right? If I wrote it down here and I can find it quickly and it's exactly where I expect it to be, yeah, then I can say that I know what grade Mary got. And so maybe if we want to understand knowledge, what we have to understand is people's artifacts and their technology and the way that they maybe write down things or the way that they can look up things. I mean, what does the accessibility of the internet, what impact does that have on the way that our knowledge works, for instance, right? And what if I can get the internet on the inside of my glasses? Or what if I can get the internet on the inside of my consciousness through some bizarre neural link or something like that? I mean, that's a little bit sci-fi maybe, but it's interesting uh, from an epistemological point of view, and it has to do with a subject that is concrete enough to be in a particular technological situation. Dialing down the sci-fi uh, a bit, 
uh, we can also try to think of, of subjects in terms of um, their social position and um, experiences in such a way that, you know, the kind of knowledge that is available to them, especially through testimony, might depend on their own background, their own social position, uh, even on things like their, their age or their gender, which normally we don't talk about in epistemology. So here's the kind of thing I'm, well, here's the kind of thing I'm not talking about, right? If you ask somebody, okay, what was um, the most popular Beatles song? Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, well, that's maybe not a great, but what was the most popular song in the summer of 1974? I mean, everybody could know that by looking it up, but if you actually lived in 1974 and were old enough to listen to the radio, you might have access to this knowledge in a slightly different way, in a slightly easier way, right? So that's a way that age might have something to do with knowledge. That's not what I want to talk about. Uh, what I want to talk about is situations where people get the exact same evidence, and yet that evidence might be enough for one of them to gain knowledge and for the other not enough to gain knowledge, because of the kind of um, connection they can have. That's how we could uh, phrase it. The kind of connection they could have to the person giving this evidence, in particular to the person giving this kind of testimony. So let's try to make that concrete and let's make it concrete using a kind of example that we've all seen in the news quite a lot over the last uh, uh, years. So let's talk about um, we could take any kind of famous role, I suppose, but let's take a famous movie director. So there's a famous movie director. And this famous movie director, um, let's say I see a news item that explains to me that this famous movie director has been accused very recently by several uh, actresses that he worked with in the early stages of their careers over the past 15 years of completely inappropriate behavior, sexual harassment, who knows what, assault maybe even. Um, and so that's what I hear. There are several actresses and they all have very similar uh, things to say about this director, very similar accusations to make. And some of them, it's supposed to have happened very recently. Others, it happened as much as 15 years ago and they never talked about it until today. And so I, I might be seeing this, this new show, this, this news item. And maybe I think, well, I, I don't know what to think. Right? Maybe that's what I think. I don't know what to think. I mean, on the one hand, there are these several people who all have a very similar story. So that lends a lot of weight to that. But why on earth would somebody wait 15 years? I mean, if something really terrible happens, why would you not tell people about it and wait 15 years to come forward? I don't understand. Right? That might be what I think. I don't understand. I don't know what to make of this. And if I don't know what to make of it, I don't know what to believe. I don't believe anything. I'm not getting any knowledge at this point, right? I'm not getting any knowledge. And maybe there's somebody else watching the exact same news show, getting the exact same information. But this person uh, has, a, has a way easier time sort of putting themselves into the shoes of these actresses whose testimony we are hearing, right? Maybe this person has worked in extremely hierarchical situations, which I haven't really. Uh, maybe this person has been a victim of harassment or assault, which luckily I haven't. Um, and so maybe this person has a very easy time understanding why in a situation like that, where there are these strong hierarchies, where this person at the top is like really at the top, um, where you are extremely dependent on them and on their friends probably, uh, why even if something pretty terrible happens, you might not come forward with it, right? And think, oh, nobody's gonna believe me anyway, or, or nothing's gonna change. I'm just gonna ruin my own career. Maybe they have a very easy time understanding that, right? Maybe they don't even have to think about it. Maybe it's completely natural to them that people wouldn't come forward. And so they hear the same evidence. In a sense, they have a much closer connection to the people giving the evidence, allowing them to understand and um, understand the situation better and see the weight of the evidence better than I can and come to a right conclusion, right? I'm gonna assume that in this case, the accusations are correct. Um, and so that person would get knowledge, right? I'm not getting knowledge. I don't know what to make of the situation. That person does get knowledge. That seems fairly possible in a, a, a uh, situation like this, but also, of course, in much more, um, in much less charged situations, right? I mean, every day we hear testimony by people 
that we might be in a much better position to evaluate if we are closer in sort of social space to those people, if it's easier for us to understand their experience, to understand their thought processes and so on. And so it would seem that the kind of knowledge that you can get, for instance, from testimony is not just going to depend on, I don't know, some Umium abstract story about the reliability of testimony. Uh, it might be based on fairly specific facts about you, right? Fairly specific facts, including things like um, your age, your gender, the kind of jobs that you have had and so on and so forth. Things that normally we might not talk about in epistemology, but things that we might be interested in as epistemologists. Not maybe when we are trying to improve on the get your analysis of knowledge, but when we try to understand specific situations, right? When we try to understand why people have different opinions or make different judgments in certain situations, um, why um, certain types of, of witnesses are believed more easily in court than other types of witnesses and so on, right? So as soon as epistemology becomes more practical, as soon as it becomes more interested in concrete cases, well, we should open our eyes to all the ways that concrete facts about people are going to have an influence on what knowledge they can gain and how they can gain it. And so that's one of the things that social epistemology also does. And that's one of the reasons why, yeah, it's completely fine to do epistemology in terms of the abstract S, but it's also important to think about sometimes very concrete facts about our own societies. 